Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and this is Finding Respect in the Chaos. If you've been with this show before, you know that it's all about giving survivors of abuse a safe place to come and tell their stories and a place for advocates to come out and share important resources to help facilitate healing. Today, I am here with an amazing survivor story. I'm here with Ashley Nakanishi. Thank you so much for coming, Ashley. Thank you so I'm much so for happy. having me on your show. Thank oh, you. gosh, I'm so happy to have you, Harold. Can you have such an amazing story? Oh, such an amazing story. And I'm just honored to know you, really, I am. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming out and being brave enough to tell your story and to show others that there's hope and healing on the other side of abuse. Thank you, Cynthia, for having me. I oh, yeah. It. No kidding, man. I've got chicken skin already. Now. <laughs> so, okay, first off, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your Okinawan ancestral roots and stuff like that. I think that's a really interesting part of who you are. Absolutely. So, uh, my mother's side, all roots uh, in Okinawa. So, our family has been there for countless generations. It is, a, it is a part of me that I carry really deeply in my bones, and <laughs> I represent it everywhere that I go. Uh, nice. I, I carry my family very much on my sleeve. Uh, that is without a doubt. And I mean, not just my mother's family, of course. Uh, I carry the history of my father's family as well, and I think it's, it's quite important to understand where you come from. Right? I think we have a picture of your family, don't we? I, I believe so, ah, yes, ah, yes. It's a big it family. Is. It is a big family, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, so our our family has quite a unique history, actually, through honestly very much intergenerational trauma. We have all learned how to be successful in the healing process, and I think that that was something I really took away whenever I went back home in Okinawa, and I got to revisit some of the places that I haven't been in years, and it really taught nice. me the the art of resilience is really within one's soul, and it's very possible. Right. And I think that, that that wouldn't be possible without my parents somehow connecting all their traumatic histories together and kind of giving the world these like bodhisattvas willing to suffer for <laughs> all this uh, wisdom, really, right? right. And, it's, and, that's, and that's so much more important than intellect. It's right. wisdom and compassion yes. and empathy. And those are only yes. real things that you can really understand through suffering. Without it, you couldn't really empathize with somebody. You couldn't really build compassion without enduring those things yourself, right? right? Or really putting yourself in someone else's shoes. And my parents right. made that such an important task for us growing up. You know, always making sure that we are seeing things not just from our own lens. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So you have a book that you wrote. And yes. I'm, yes. I'm really excited for people to hear about this book. Yes. And and first, kind of take us through the choice of the, the cover. Cause oh, absolutely. There was, um, so this book was quite a project. It was a project of many minds. Um, I, and, it, and that says so in the very back, where I thank everybody in my acknowledgments. I mean, it is, it is quite lengthy in, in that sense. <laughs> uh, the book came together through a number of experiences, and I had just lost a really dear friend of mine. And I kind of went into a really dark place. <laughs> it brought up a lot of memories for me from when I was in New Mexico, and when I had endured a, a lot of traumatic incidences, one after another after another, uh, from gang rape to homelessness to pregnancy to single motherhood to you know uh, withdrawing from drug addictions it was it was such wow. a, a turbulent time and I really had to learn to navigate through those winds and and find inner peace and that's how this book really came to be um, a lot of detail went into it you know and, uh, and we argued about the cover for so long they're like you cannot have breasts showing on a page and I was like that is what I'm putting on my book I was like motherhood is important free the nipple you know what I mean so I was, uh, I was very I was a very much advocate for that and you know and I really wanted people when they read this book when they thumbed through these pages I wanted them to know that they had an impact on somebody. I wanted them to know that they had an impact on me too, right? right? That's why, so when you read this page, like if you read this as much as my sister has, I took her copy. <laughs> so, 
uh, you know, you really start to see how dirty the white That's is like mine. Come. Yeah. You can, you can see mine. Right. <laughs> Stained up dog eared pages. And I read it all the time. They're just beautiful poems in here. Maybe you could read us a couple. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. That would be uh, awesome. I, absolutely. Um, I have a couple that just to introduce the piece before I kind of dive into the history of what inspired this work. Okay. Um, so the first one is called uh, By Design. Fall in love with me on these pages. Remind me that you see more than my skin, feel more than my curves, need more than this body and these lips to keep you warm. Explore me the way that you do art. So when you decide to love me, it's less about how I work my body and more about my body of work. So um, I wrote that just kind of as an introduction to this, to this book, really to inspire young women to hold themselves accountable for what are they producing? What are, what are they? What do they want? And what are they magnifying towards them? Correct. Right. And also, and to kind of give retrospect to men, you know, who might try to reproach somebody with the wrong intentions in mind. And you know, and that was uh, when my my daughter's father, like when we first got together, before all the craziness went down. You know, it was really more about falling in love with him is such an art. You know, we, right. it was such a mindful experience, you know, and even now that I reflect on it, it still is, you know, and I, and I have to remember that all the time. Uh, but before I remembered that, I wrote a series of angry poems too. <laughs> so, um, well, I, I'm yes. sorry, if it's okay, if we get just a little yeah. bit of detail about your Absolutely. daughter's father is, right. and she's a product of the rape, right? Is this right? Yes. So, um, if you if you feel comfortable talking about it anyway, no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, I do I do talk about this a lot for Domestic Violence Action Center. Okay. Well, I don't want to put you on the spot. If no you worries. Want. <laughs> no. It's okay. Uh, you couldn't put me on the spot more than I already do, so don't even worry okay. about that at all. Um, okay. Yeah. So I, I lived in New Mexico, as you know, and I was boxing there at the time. Boxing. I, Wait, I want to hear about that later. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll touch base with that. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, I was boxing at the time, and uh, a friend of mine introduced me to a man outside of a bus stop, and he asked me for change for the bus, and I was like, "Who is this man? Like, who does he think he is?" And uh, I ended up only having a dollar, so he asked me to join him on this bus stop, right? And I, we went on this bus tour, basically, through our own city, and, and I was fascinated by him. I was enthralled by him. I was addicted to him, really, like a drug. Mm -hmm. And months quickly led to a year before I knew it, we were engaged. Um, and we were, you know, uh, we had hit, like, a hard place at one point where... We were doing a lot of drugs together. We were experimenting with a lot of other uh, narcotics as well. And that I really started to see this other side of him come up, this almost ominous and evil-like nature take over him. Mm -hmm. And when I had come to address it, you know, we had, we had a lot of tribulations happening already. So that, that friction was real, that tension was real. And when I came to him and told him I didn't want any more, I was done. Uh, he he wasn't having that, you know, and it was uh, it was around Christmas. I remember because he had he had hit me with something like on my way out of the house. He had hit me with something, and I remember I just remember feeling something so painful, and then passing out. And and uh, when I woke up, I was uh, tied face down onto a bed where I was for weeks. Uh, you know, the days kind of blended really together, and uh, it was a horrifying experience. It was a horrifying experience. And whenever he realized that I didn't want anything to do with him anymore, you know, he owed money to drug dealers. So I was gang raped multiple times. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and that was, it was an awful thing to endure. So sorry, you had to. Yeah, no, it's okay, you know, uh, we'll talk, so we'll bring back up the boxing. Uh, so <laughs> I was right? not... I could not succumb to dying. I remember just thinking, I remember wanting to die and saying I wanted to die, and then I couldn't, and I couldn't, and I just, you know, every part of me, I was made from people of resilience. I was made from people of resistance, and this was not the way I was going to go out, you know, you. and and I was so traumatized by the fact that this man I loved would do something like this to right. me that it made me so cold, so animalistic almost, you know, that when I had escaped, I mean, I escaped, and it wasn't like I went out and was, like, catching a ride, texting an Uber. It wasn't yeah. like that. It was like me hitting this man with a pot and, wow. and, and forcing me my way out. And I was half naked through Albuquerque. I remember being half naked through Albuquerque in the snow, and I was like, Woo! It was so cold. And then uh, my sister's friend coincidentally happened to be driving by 
and she saw me. She thought I was my sister. And so, uh, just like this is a small island, New Mexico is a small place, you right. know, and, uh, and she gave me a ride. And, uh, and I was basically homeless for the next few months until I was able to make enough money to come back home. Wow. And when I came back home, uh, found out I was four months pregnant. And uh, whenever wow. the doctor told me the timeline, I knew that, uh, I knew it had to come from those experiences. So, I mean, I'll never really know who my daughter's real father is. And uh, that's never been important to me. Because in my mind, I mean, I associate him with my daughter just sheerly through the relationship in which she came. But uh, in my mind, that never mattered because she was my daughter. Right. She was my child. And at the end of the day, I pulled the best of him and the best of me together to create this beautiful gift. You know? Right. Good yeah. for you. What a Thank great you. way to look at it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it took a long time. It did not you easy. are a soldier, girl. <laughs> it was not easy. It was not easy. Uh, I, I, did, I did go through a lot. And... Uh, and I was so angry, you know, I was so angry. Right. And I became very almost heartless in the endeavor of pursuing ever a new relationship. There's a poem in here. I'm going to stop you right yeah, there. Yeah, no, go ahead. It's like my favorite, one of my favorite poems in this book. And it's, be angry, be silently enraged. Take your time gathering the words and the strength that it takes to speak instead of cry. Mm. <sighs> I love that. I, I can't, I'm, as a survivor of um, severe abuse myself, that, that poem just speaks to me. I can't imagine that it wouldn't speak to all survivors because right. it's what we need to be able to do to gather ourselves, to be able to speak our truth. And I think that in speaking our truths, we can change the paradigm of men being able to get away with these kinds of things like they have been for so many years. Absolutely. And, and part of talking about it is breaking that cycle, right? right. And that was exactly. something I really wanted to stress in this book is that when I, right, for example, like Martin Luther King said, the truth shall set you free. Yep. Right. And uh, that was, this was probably the most honest dialogue I've ever had with myself. Like this book, whenever we, uh, whenever it went out and people started buying it and reading it and reviewing it, I was like, oh, snap. I was like, ooh. Uh, I was really concerned because this was all of me in this right. book. This was my history in this book. And this was kind of my journey through motherhood, single motherhood, as a student, as a sister, as a friend, as a victim, as a survivor, as a fighter. It was so much effort. I was exhausted. Like even at the party when we were signing books, I was like, "Man, I am tired. I'm so <laughs> tired." And then somebody came up to me and they and they and they said the same poem. They they reflected on it so hard, and she said, "I just wanted to thank you." Yeah. And, and and I didn't I didn't know how to respond because this was the first time I'd ever actually given someone else a voice. Right. And that was such an important feeling. And that's exactly something right. that I really I really want to emphasize. Right. And that was because right. if if you are by any means successful, then you know you have altered one life, made one life easier to live, right? And and it's, yep. it's quite vital. It's quite vital. And I think that the journey there, though long, you know, it's it's so beautiful. Once you once you look past all that ugly, like I mean, I still right. have scars. I got scars on my back. You know, I got scars on my. You know, I have scars everywhere. I have a missing part of my ear over here. I mean, I, you know, it wasn't, it was a fight. It was a war. And I, and I have a map of that war on my body because I remember that. I take it with me. I let that fuel me. I don't let that crush me right. anymore. You know, I'm not, right. I'm not stunted by PTSD anymore. I mean, of course right. there are days. Don't get me wrong. There are days <laughs> I smell something. I'm like, oh, <laughs> but, uh. But more importantly, uh, it really influenced my work that I do with the DVAC, right? And as well as what I do in the community now. Um, so, uh, I guess. Uh, okay, so we're about to go to break. Absolutely. So before we do, there's another poem I love so much. Absolutely. Doing what you can with what the world provides, this is true success. So I'd say you got true success, girl. <laughs> All right, we are going to take a break. And we will be back in just a couple of minutes. And I hope that you will stay with us because I want to share with you some of the things that she's doing now, which are pretty amazing things, making a huge difference for other survivors and other victims. So if you'll please come back. Girl. 
good afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at three o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Hey, aloha, Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand the Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. Welcome back to Finding Respect in the Chaos on Think Tech Hawaii. I am here today with Ashley Nakanishi, who is an amazing survivor that has an amazing story of triumph over tragedy. And I'm so grateful to have you here. And wow, just that you're willing to share your heart and soul in this book and with me today on the show. You know what you were saying before we went to break about having it be an honor to give someone a voice. Mm. You know, I, I almost started to cry and cut, I got all kind of chicken skin over here <laughs> because um, that's how I feel about being able to have this show and have a place, a safe place right. for survivors to come and tell their stories because I believe that when we do, there's healing in the telling. Right, absolutely. And, and I want everyone to have that opportunity. Absolutely, right? I completely agree. I think... Uh, I really believe that these experiences shape the way that I see the world. And and it really made me think about what is justice and right. and what is what is my task in this lifetime and what can I do for my community to help them heal from the atrocities of trauma. Right. And so when I really started kind of getting into the whole DVAC and the, and the poetry world and the acting and then I was thinking, I was like, man, but there are these kids that I'm seeing outside and they they don't have somebody right. steering them, helping them through life because their parents are busy working and that's not their problem. You know, we live in a society that's not, that does not allow for a family to function the way it used to. Right. And that is a sad thing to see it in this is life. a sad thing, and I agree. And when they don't have a role model or somebody that just helps them, you know, so. Maybe they know they can talk to and trust. Right. Because they don't, they're separated from that that trusting adult or they're betrayed but by even that peers. trusting adult. I mean, people, I mean, so much of our, of our kind of, our trust ideals are misrepresented in our friendships. They're misrepresented right. in our relationships and the, and the relationships we have with our coworkers and our friends and our mothers and our fathers and our cousins and our baby daddy, 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 you know what I mean? So <laughs> we, right. you know, we have to learn how to kind of communicate in these relationships. And that's really kind of what, got me into doing what I do now. Uh, okay, tell so, us about that, because right. I think everybody needs to know about that. So, That's a really cool thing. <laughs> so what I do now, I, I work with the at-risk youth um, in Hawaii and through the United States. I work in detention centers, prisons, and basically what I do is orchestrating a workshop for transitional assistance, right? So moving from the kind of prison mentality to the community mentality and how are we really shaping these people to perform outside because there's not many assist there's not much assistance mm -hmm. as much as people say there is the prison system needs perhaps some of the most attention yes. perhaps some of the most love perhaps some of the most acceptance and that is something very hard for some people to give and i've been right. blessed with a mother and a father that have taught me to be compassionate and to work with people who have had hardships that maybe allowed them to make the wrong decision in their life. Right. So um, what I do is basically, uh, I open up a workshop, we talk about identity. That was actually, that was a great help in getting a, a friend. A poetry yeah. workshop, you mean? Yeah, you so okay. I, yeah, so I host them inside of the detention centers or where uh, wherever we are located. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to disclose yeah, that that's information. Okay. Yeah, right. But uh, what we do basically is I open up with a workshop. We talk about who are you in this community and how does that community see you, right? right? So after we move on from that, 
we kind of use that to build a personal essay. And from this personal essay, we start looking at college applications. From these college applications, we start shifting to job applications. I think we have a picture of you work with some of the kids that you work with. Right? Yeah, so this is Pacific Tongues. This is how it all started. This is how I got nice. invested into the program. And I have to give them so much love because they really helped. They really, really helped with everything. You know, they weren't just my brothers and sisters in arms. These people were my confidants in life. And these Aww, nice. and they really taught me so much about being an educator and a facilitator. And right. uh, and that helps a lot with these programs because these kids need to right. know they can relate to you. And fortunately, right. through my own traumas, I'm allowed a position fortunate enough to understand. You know, maybe not maybe not understand, but at least better empathize. And right. that's something so important for them to see because you know, it's hard for them to see a woman. They're like, who are you and what are you doing trying to teach me something about life? What do you know about life? Exactly. And, and, and you, I, got, you know a couple and, things. And I can just sit and be like, okay, <laughs> right? yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. That's <laughs> and, and, uh, read my book and then come back. No. Yeah, and that's, but it's a beautiful thing because, you know, after these years have gone by and, and we do these workshops and we get them these essays done and I teach them how to write scholarship applications and, and all these things and we talk about real right. opportunities. Right. You know, and then uh, basically what I'm trying to do now is finish developing my nonprofit organization that allows entrepreneurs and artists to come together and kind of nice. mentor these young minds and, to, right. and fostering this youth to be successful, brilliant. you know, brilliant. because these kids have so many different avenues of success mm -hmm. for them. And, the, and they're so creative and they're mm. so genuinely sincere. It, it blows my mind every time I see them, and, and, it, and it breaks my heart every time I hear them, you know, right. because I know that they're doing everything they can to smile today. Right. And sometimes that's enough. And, and, and teaching them that that's enough sometimes, you know, right. and, just, and just forgive yourself sometimes, you know. Right. I talk about that a lot here on the show. Oh, about, do you? <laughs> well, well that we're finding respect. We're looking for respect. Right, right, right. right. Yes. So we're trying to find the respect, and sometimes we need to find it for ourselves. Absolutely. It's not a necessarily a thing that is out there in the world that we have to go and find. It's something that we need to find for our own selves. Absolutely. Right? And, that's a, and that's a powerful message, right? And that's, that's something that takes time. And, right. you know, and, and not all my students come out and do great things in the world. I'm not saying, but, but, but there's you always can, one. Yeah, there's if always you can that ease one. the condition yeah. of their soul, even if they don't come out and do great things, at least they feel a little less anxious, maybe a little less hateful of right. themselves. And that is a huge thing. Right. Not, and so don't belittle that part either. And if there's only yeah. one that comes out and does great things, that's wonderful. But that's the thing is, you, right. you know who those students will be. Right. What's more important is focusing on the ones that are not going to be those people and right. teaching them how to the, still stay positive right. in the means of chaos and how to navigate through their traumas in a way that does not allow them to be a dysfunction in society. Right. But instead, offering more opportunities to others with their experiences. Right. Right. Absolutely. Because everybody's story is powerful. And truly, we are all in the world's narrative. Right. Yes, we so are. So it's really important to kind of encapsulate these ideas mm -hmm. and come together and rise against the things that are oppressing us, be it a person or a family member or a government. You know, I mean, I'm really big on activism, as you know, but uh, <laughs> we'll jump into that story later. You've got one in here that I love, that uh, I absolutely love. Um, wait, it's up here. When the word justice outweighs the power of truth the world is corrupt and right now I'm afraid that the world's pretty corrupt you know but there's <laughs> there's a way of changing that you know sometimes I agree. sometimes it takes seeing corruption to really bring to mind the fact that we need change and yes, that's something that I think that's something that actually our, our community is doing a really great job of, you know, with the Women's March, with Black Lives Matter movement right. I mean, that's spreading through a lot of cities and, right well, and now, here yeah. in Hawaii we have a different sort of um what the aloha spirit is it yeah. is prevalent here right aloha. and it is pervasive mm. through all of these different things and fields so we are, i don't think we are exactly suffering in the same way a lot of mainland is right and that was something i got to experience when i went out to la and i was working in some of their centers over there and you know a 14 year old child over there that's a 21 year old man over here that is a different kind of person. Yeah. They have different types of experiences. And I'm not trying to take away from anyone's trauma, no, no, nor am I trying I to invalidate anybody else's. But no, no. what I'm saying is I there's a it. difference and we need more people. We need members yes, of our community to come in because these young kids, 
they right. don't have much of a community that's supporting them. And I'm not saying it's their family's fault, because it is not, right? right. It's, not a, it's not a product of family. It's not a product of education. It's more so they need somebody that's going to say, I'm here for you. Right. I, I'm here for you when you're mad at me. I'm here for you when you're happy with me. I'm here for you through all of that, because I want you to know that I can be your rock. That's awesome. Right. You also do something else that's pretty cool. You have a poetry slam. Oh, yes. Right? Yeah, and yeah, we yeah. even have some pictures of you at the poetry slam. Thank yeah, you. I love that picture. <laughs> I took that picture. I love that picture. Yes, I hosted a poetry slam for the last uh, right? five years. And then, uh, yes, and then I, I recently just performed in Women of the World uh, Poetry Slam. And, and we've got another, po I think we have another picture of all the people that were there at the poetry slam. Yeah, yes. this is so a big one. That's my family. Right? Right? That's my family. Because we love you. Yeah, and that's, and, uh, that's such an important thing. I like, think we have um, just a not very much more time, but I think it's important that people hear about the new, you're having a poetry slam thing. Yes. Absolutely. Because we just so, got a couple minutes left is absolutely. all. Absolutely. So, so uh, the work that I'm involved with now, it's called uh, Dragon's Breath, The Revolution. So this is all for poets from around the island to come together every Thursday at the Dragon Upstairs above Hanks in Chinatown at 7 p.m. Be there. Be, Be there. there. Yes. So that's again every Thursday, Dragon's Breath Revolution upstairs in the Dragon 7 p.m. I hope to see you all there. Thank you again. Cynthia, oh my gosh, no, thank show. you thank for you. coming. Are you kidding? <laughs> Ashley, I want you it to come back. Lot. We need thank a couple you. hours to have a show. It's not long enough right. for this girl. Um, I hope all of you will go out and get this book. Um, it is well worth every minute of tears and laughter. And you're going to want to stand up and shout hallelujah and all of that stuff when you read it. You. So I want to tell you that it is an honor to have you come and join me in this show, Finding Respect in the Chaos. I am Cynthia Lee Sinclair. This is Think Tech Hawaii. And if you have a story you'd like to share and you'd like to maybe come on the show and tell your story, you can email me at survivorcentral at thinktechhawaii.com. And if you need help, there's some numbers here on the screen. Write them down. Make sure you're safe when you call them. And make sure you reach out for help. You're not alone. Thank you for joining us here today. And I hope you'll join us next time on Finding Respect in the Chaos.